Dr. James Tircero uh, received MD from Johns Hopkins University, and he completed uh, clinical training at MGH. And he did postdoctoral training at the Broad Institute with Sika Kassir-san and Patrick Elino. Uh, his interest is understanding the common variant genetic basis for cardiovascular diseases using deep learning. Uh, his topic today is cardiac age acceleration. Uh, floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you for the intro. I figured nobody knows me since I just got here last year. So by way of introduction, um, I was a Sarnoff fellow in St. Catherine's lab at the Broad a decade ago. Uh, we were focused on exome sequencing when that was a new technology. Uh, and we, we found like ANG PTL3 is a cause of very low LDL. Um, I disappeared for a decade from my clinical training and then came back uh, to work with Anthony Philippakis, who is the chief data officer at the Broad, and Patrick Eleanor, who's the chair of cardiology, um, really focused on uh, deep learning for structural inference uh, and common variant genetics of the heart. So the work that I've done so far has focused on sort of all aspects of structural heart disease, so aortic aneurysm, uh, looking at aortic root diameter, ventricular structure and function, um, and sort of how do you pull these things together, reconstruct a three-dimensional or four-dimensional heart, um, and then thinking beyond just the structure and also thinking about the function. So here's an example where we're looking at uh, velocities across the aortic valve and dynamic flows. Um, one thing that ties all of that work together is that we can always see an association between cardiac structure and function and age. And this is something that people have noticed for a long time. Uh, maybe a, a prominent example of this is from Mesa, looking at, in this case, L left ventricular end diastolic volume, which is smaller in older people, not just secularly, but also within individuals over time, the end diastolic volume gets smaller. So there's an age relationship with cardiac structure. And it prompts the question, like, is aging uniform uh, within a person and across their organs or maybe reframed? Could we identify people whose cardiac age is accelerated or decelerated uh, with respect to their chronological age? This is a concept that has been around in many different ways over a long period of time. So these are just a couple of plots from uh, Horvath's papers uh, over a decade ago, looking at uh, methylation as an epigenetic uh, age marker. And essentially, you're just building a predictor. Uh, in this case, uh, it's uh, methylation, but it doesn't really matter what it is. Whatever your predictor is, you've got an age predictor, and you're looking at the difference between your predicted age and your chronological age. That is a simplified version of age acceleration. So essentially, you're building a model and you're asking, what is the error in my model? And then instead of saying like, oh gosh, I wish my model were better, you're like, cool, I found a new biomarker. That is the fundamental idea behind age acceleration. I'm gonna skip this and come back to it later. So <clears throat> you can imagine that people have thought about this for cardiac imaging in the past. And I'm going to walk you through three different papers uh, that have looked at this. One is with imaging-derived phenotypes. So the structures and the measurements that cardiologists know and understand and talk to each other about. Um, so aortic diameter, atrial size, ventricular size. They also pulled in uh, uh, imaging of fibrosis and EKGs. And so this simply inverts the usual association where you're using age and maybe some covariates to estimate end diastolic volume in a prediction model. Here, we're just flipping that around. We're trying to predict age from end diastolic volume, aortic diameter, et cetera. So that's the first paper. The second uses a concept of radiomics. So the first pass here is to identify the cardiac structures. So they're using semantic segmentation or labeling of all the pixels in the heart. So that way they can compute various parameters using an off-the-shelf uh, Python package called pyradiomics. And so then you have these sort of more abstract variables that don't necessarily have a direct meaning, but they tend to capture information like texture, brightness, uh, shape, size. And you can then use that to predict age. And then the final paper that I'll show you is uh, by a group that took uh, videos uh, of the heart from the two, three, and four chamber view. Now, you might look at the screen and say, I'm not sure where the heart is in these images. And I think you'd be right, because there's a lot 
that's going on in videos of the heart. So this video right here that you're looking at is an MRI with someone who's laying on their back, their feet are coming out um, through the screen towards you, and their head is sort of through the wall. And this is a cross section through the heart. The part that's moving is the heart. Everything else is lung or soft tissue, bones, fat. And as you can imagine, there's probably a lot of information about your age encoded in all those other structures. So uh, with a talented Sarnoff fellow who uh, I'm jointly mentoring with Joff Tyson at UCSF, his name is James Brundage, and we're focused now on trying to strip away all the other structures so we can specifically study cardiac age acceleration. We use the UK Biobank, which is a study of half a million uh, volunteers in the UK, aged 40 to 70 at enrollment. Um, they all have genetic data, and 60,000 of them have undergone cardiac MRI with no reason for imaging. So this is purely research imaging, so you're sort of liberated from the usual issue of confounding by indication. So we do the usual first pass of semantic segmentation. Again, it's the process of training a deep learning model to recognize the different cardiac structures. And here, instead of building a three-dimensional heart, we are simply blacking out all the non-cardiac structures. Now we're left with cardiovascular uh, imaging over time only. And we simply use that as input into a regression deep learning model. So it's a video model that is predicting one number, just your chronological age, based on these videos that we have pre-processed to strip out all the non-cardiac structures. And just, just to say, there is a lot of QC that we do up front. I'm not going to dwell on it. But there are images where uh, they've captured the wrong view, where the heart's not visible, or where there's a ton of noise. So you do have to be aware of that, because that will show up as an outlier on your age regression model. So now we can come back to this, which is just the distribution of cardiac age acceleration, which is, by definition in our population, because of how we're defining it, going to be mean-centered at zero. Uh, and then the range goes from negative 10 to 10 years of age acceleration. So people in the red are accelerated. Their heart looks older than you would expect based on their chronologic age. And in blue, they look younger. So how do we do? I've laid out those three papers that I've talked about uh, in this table, and then our current work is in yellow at the bottom. Uh, one metric that you might use is R squared, so the percent of variance in age that you're able to explain with your model. We do better than you would do if you're simply using measurements or radiomics. We don't do as well as if you use all the information that's contained in these videos. I think not surprising that there's some information that we're missing by stripping out that information. We hope that we make it up on the back end by being able to interpret something that we're extracting. So first pass for me is like a gut check. Like if I know something should be true, is it still true? In this case, we're asking, and I'm showing you here like an AHA uh, LV thickness model, where all these segments are something that an echo sonographer would measure. Uh, if you have an accelerated cardiac age, is this thicker or less thick or no change? And almost all these segments are thicker among people who have a greater cardiac age acceleration. So that's kind of reassuring. It's not surprising, but it's good to see. And then we can think about other questions like behavior. So here the zero line is uh, the baseline, no change. And this is for non-smokers or non-drinkers. Um, the x-axis on the left is pack years of smoking. The, uh, the x-axis on the right is uh, standard uh, American drinks per week. And so people who smoke more and drink more appear to have accelerated cardiac aging. And then we can look at physical activity, so another behavior. So this question here, the baseline is most people do not achieve the AHA recommended amount of physical activity, which is 150 minutes per week of moderate to vi vigorous physical activity. So that's your zero line. Um, on the left is active, which is just anyone who's achieved that 150 minutes per week. And on the right is the weekend warrior pattern, which has sort of popped up a few times recently, where some people really get all their physical activity activity over the course of one or two days. That's sort of a weekend warrior. It doesn't have to be on the weekend. But we still see that those folks also have decelerated cardiac aging. So it looks like however you get your activity, it's beneficial. Now, obviously, their age deceleration is less than the, the other folks. And that's probably because the dosage of exercise tends to be higher than people who work out more days of the week. I think 
that philosophically it's not surprising that people who work out have decelerated cardiac aging, but sort of mechanically it is a little bit surprising, and this is because we know, one, from Tim Churchill's work uh, at Mass General Hospital, that elite athletes tend to have bigger aortas, for example. And we also know that aortas get larger with age. And so you might have a model in your mind, like I did, that more physical activity leads to things like a bigger aorta, which would then be predicted to have an accelerated cardiac aging, which is not what we saw. So there is something in the model that is able to recognize that a healthy person's large aorta it does not look as bad as someone who has an abnormally large aorta for other reasons. And that's something that you can't capture with these human-defined measurements that we can capture with the deep learning model. We can also look at relationship between cardiac age acceleration and proteomics. So sort of zooming in here on the proteins whose expression levels are higher among those with accelerated cardiac aging, we say, see some players that have been known for a long time. So NT, proteomics, P, GDF15, cathepsin D, these are proteins that have previously been associated, uh, higher levels have been associated with disease or with uh, um, uh, worsening heart failure or coronary disease. And then on the flip side, there are some proteins that look lower in people with uh, accelerated cardiac aging. Uh, those include proteins that have been previously shown to be downregulated in people with heart failure. Uh, CA14 and CA6, you know, carbonic hydrase is a little bit odd, but there is some evidence that this has been involved in like lactate transport across the sarcolemma. So I think that there's probably still a role, whether that's actually functional or if this is simply cardiac damage, that we would not be able to say. So then we can also look at disease. So if you walk into the study and you've already had a diagnosis of, for example, dilated cardiomyopathy, your heart tends to look older by about half a year. Um, that is true also for aortic aneurysm, for AFib, for diabetes, for someone who a doctor thought should get an echo, like doctors are smart people, and they select people who are sick for imaging studies. So all those people have accelerated cardiac aging on average. But I think it's reassuring if you look at random diseases that shouldn't be associated with cardiovascular disease. So allergic rhinitis, cancer, cataracts. You know, cancer and cataracts are certainly associated with aging. And so it would be sort of unfortunate if we are simply dragging along all age-associated disease. It would really take away from what we think we're finding. But those are not associated with cardiac age acceleration. So this is still sort of just uh, validating our phenotype. We can also look forward. So let's say you roll into the study. You get your MRI. You don't have disease at the time of MRI but you're in the top fifth percentile now for cardiac age acceleration. We do, we look at your images, we say, yep, you have accelerated aging. Does that mean you're at risk for anything? And the answer is yes. In particular, you're at five to tenfold higher risk for dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy diagnosis in subsequent about five to 10 years. Um, uh, those dominate this plot, so I'm just going to delete them as we go to the next slide. Um, and so we still see age acceleration associated with increased risk for being diagnosed with aneurysm, with AFib, um, with a doctor thinking, gosh, I should order some imaging, and with mortality. And that mortality is not driven by cancer, right? So I'm, I'm circling cancer again because having cancer doesn't predict age acceleration. Having cardiac age acceleration doesn't predict cancer. This is really a specific uh, phenotype for the cardiovascular system. It doesn't predict acute coronary syndrome, which may be a little bit odd, right? You're saying, uh, I'm sitting here telling you, oh, it predicts aneurysm um, and you know, cardiomyopathies, but why not coronary disease? I think the answer is we're simply not imaging the coronaries. In, in the adult heart, in a four-chamber view MRI, you get a tiny cross-section uh, of your circumflex and maybe your RCA. So I think it's simply that we don't see it. So you know, I'm a common variant geneticist, so the whole point of all this for me was to uh, conduct a GWAS. We're still in the process of interpreting this, but I will say that we identified 23 loci 
eight of them and probably actually more, um, glancing at a few more of these, are certainly associated with either left ventricular or left atrial structure and function. Um, and then, I mean, so like, you know, you've probably seen Titan, Desmoplakin, uh, NPR3 is like the natriuretic peptide uh, clearance receptor. Uh, and then moving on to the vascular loci, so elastin is the top hit here, right? So 40% of the bulk mass of aorta is elastin. So we're certainly picking up on cardiac and vascular loci. How does this relate to the prior work? So most of those prior studies also looked at the, the genetics. I'm gonna focus in particular on that other end-to-end -end deep learning paper, because I think that's the most similar. Now they have a higher R squared. So they explain age better than we do. They have a much higher heritability. In other words, the proportion of their age uh, model that's explained by common genetic variants is also much higher than ours is. And many people have used that historically as like the measure for what is a good GWAS or have you defined your phenotype well? Is, is your heritability higher? But I think here we see, you know, we identify 23 loci with a very similar sample size in literally the same participants. They also use the UK Biobank. So this is like the same people and they found four loci. And I think that this has to do with the specificity of the phenotype where if you're pulling in all the uh, you know, external structures, you're going to learn something, but it's not necessarily cardiovascular specific. So we have ongoing work to really understand what it is that we're finding. In particular, you know, we haven't finished the analysis to figure out um, are there GWAS loci that are not related to structures that we are already measuring? I think that's like a fundamental question that we haven't yet addressed. We also want to understand what is driving the findings. So if we, one simple way to do this is to just delete various chambers, delete the septum, rerun your analysis and understand how much does that change your prediction of age acceleration. So you can understand within that person what's driving our prediction of age acceleration for them. Um, and then, it's, you know, certainly causal inference. We've shown a bunch of correlations, but to, to get into things like Mendelian randomization, um, to try to better understand which things are likely to be intervenable in the future. So with that, I'm going to conclude um, with a, just a few kind of final reiteration points. One, obviously you can estimate cardiac age acceleration with imaging. How you do it probably matters a lot. It probably like determines whether you're gonna tell people that exercise is good or bad for your cardiovascular system. So I think like the methods actually matter here. Um, and you know, it's by definition orthogonal to chronological aging, um, but we can pick up the consequences of risk uh, and health behaviors through these uh, biomarkers. And then finally, it's, it's heritable. And the, the data that we're seeing so far, just as a gestalt, are not telling us about some global program, but it's really telling us that the underpinnings of cardiovascular biology, particularly myocardial and aortic biology, are actually the things that drive your, um, uh, your cardiac age acceleration or deceleration relative to your chronological age. So I think that, um, as we refine that message, will be something important for us to, to pin down, uh, but has consequences for how we think about uh, your risk uh, and how to mitigate that risk at a global level. So with that, I want to uh, thank particularly, again, you know, James Brundage, uh, the Sarnoff fellow who's doing all this work, um, Arun Padmanabhan, who is his uh, Sarnoff supervisor, Joff Tyson, who I'm co-mentoring him with, and then, you know, Jeff Olgan, Brian Black, and the other folks in the lab. So thank you. Okay, uh, great talk. Um, any question? Hi, thank you, very nice. Um, I was wondering whether you have or are planning on looking at those variants that are associated with um, reduced uh, aging. Yes, so I mean, one, yes. <laughs> um, but in particular, I think you know we want to tease out the, uh, like in a Mendelian randomization would be a very nice way to do it. There's a little trickiness. The largest proteomic studies that have been done so far also use the UK Biobank, but they're not perfectly overlapping with the imaging. So um, we need to update our analysis to exclude the overlapping and related participants. So we can actually conduct uh, an analysis that's not, otherwise it's just gonna be totally biased in the observational direction, which will not kind of tell us what we want. For follow-up studies, no, I'm not gonna, <laughs> 
<laughs> if there's anything you're interested in for actually pulling in humans, like please let me know, or I'll just send you the data. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> James, I was intrigued with the, the correlation between the, uh, the accelerated aging and the risk for either DCM or, or HCM. Is there a link in one direction or the other to all the known monogenic mutations? So is, is the aging simply a reflection of the mutations that then are going to you know, cause the, the yeah. thing, or is it unrelated? Right, that's a great, I mean, that's a fantastic point. I, I definitely, I guess two answers. One is, um, we are running the rare variant analyses now, so I should have like an actual answer. My assumption, um, in addition to that, is that there's a lot of undiagnosed disease. So in some sense, it's not necessarily that we are temporarily correct in, in saying that like you didn't have DCM um, because a doctor didn't diagnose you. It's just that the doctor hasn't diagnosed them yet. So I definitely think that there's a little bit of an issue um, in in terms of like what like what is what does the arrow of time mean with clinical diagnostic codes? But um, but yeah. So I don't know the the answer to the rare variant question yet. But it's a we're doing it. Hi. I, I was, I was just going to ask quickly, um, the uh, fitting with the rare variant analysis, you know, it's just curious thinking about if you have, say, roughly 1% of the population that has a rare variant within a cardiomyopathy gene and then seeing like this so enriched, it almost wonders if that's what you're picking out, these like subtle phenotypes with patients who have uh, really undiagnosed monogenic disease. Um, but it, it's, it's curious, if, I was wondering if you could actually get at that by looking at heritability analysis, like whether or not the common variants are actually predict the majority of that heritability, or is it? really driven uh, yeah, beyond I mean, that. So like the um, the heritability here is 26%, right? So that is common variant heritability. So that should be independent of rare variant her heritability, which could be non-zero, but usually is pretty low. I agree, you know, titanopathies are common enough that, I mean, I'd probably titan alone, um, you know, could explain some of this. But if you look at that distribution, I don't think it can be the answer. It could be the answer for the top 5% analyses. Um, you know, I think you get 1% of the population with a titanopathy that hasn't yet been recognized, and, and that can drive that. But um, the, um, the sort of continuous measures, we could refine it. It, it would probably make sense, for example, um, you run into this issue with the aortic valve, where if you don't lop off the extremes, you add, all of your continuous analyses are, are dominated by the people at the extremes. So I think sort of following up on both of your points, um, an analysis that really just looks at the folks in the middle to confirm that that middle ground is, is influenced both by genetics and behaviors is something that we should do. Hi, this was a great talk. Hi, this is Krotika. I'm here. Uh, this was a great talk. Um, I believe this was done, like you mentioned, this was done in UK biobanks. I believe this was predominantly in European population. I was wondering how do you think this would differ, the aging, the cardiac aging would differ in people of other uh, ancestries? And how do you how do you suppose the heritability will also differ in other ancestries? Yeah, great question. So, you know, my view on heritability across ancestries is that biology is the same across all people. Like the human populations haven't diverged that much, but that doesn't mean that the specific biologic drivers will be the same. So, like there are almost certainly population-specific genetic variants. In other words, the European genetic pool is depleted for variability, so there's going to be a lot of variation that is simply not captured in the UK biobank. Um, and, and so on a genetic level, I would expect you to find more genetic diversity elsewhere. Um, the when it comes to like you know behavioral traits, I would expect to see the same overall effect, but that's always you know mediated by genetics. So if there is a genetic variant in a population that has high enough frequency that let's say makes people not like to drink alcohol, then you may see a, a different set of loci uh, that simply don't pop up if alcohol if a gene by environment interaction was driving the underlying effect. Um, but at high level the bio Biology should be the same, but the specific loci should be different. I mean, it's important to study outside of UK Biobank. The hard part is 
yeah, you know, getting funding to conduct a large enough MRI-based study is very challenging, um, and it's really only been done once worldwide. So, uh, you know, the United States could potentially do this either with all of us or the Million Veteran Program. There has not been a commitment to do a large-scale, like, complex data, like whether it's EKG or PFTs or imaging of some sort. None of the United States biobanks have committed to doing that. So, you know, it has to be a multi-institution effort. It's There's no way that an individual can do it, or probably even a single institution. Even with retrospective data, you know, like at UCSF, we've probably done about 5,000 MRIs. Uh, and that, those are confounded by indication. So it just makes it very difficult to, you know, gain information from those studies. But it's important. The fact that it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. But we have to find out a way how to do it. A related question to that. I was curious, your UC BioMaker had the age group was up till 69 years. So I was curious whether you knew limited to that or whether that was a limited data. Only because I feel like a bunch of 70 year olds, I think, like, all have our heart problems. I was very curious about this. Decade yes. Yeah. So that is a limitation of the enrollment, like the, the recruitment that UK Biobank did. The good and bad news is that the imaging happened much later. The reason I'm saying that that's potentially bad is like many people will have died before you know, having the opportunity to do their imaging. And so you have this extraordinarily uh, like selection biased population where like if you simply got your MRI, if you use MRI as a predictor of death in the UK biobank, it reduces your risk of mortality by like 95%. So this is a super selected population. These people are incredibly healthy. But the people who actually got imaged, like there are many 80 year olds now who are getting imaged and there's, there's still 30,000 people left to go. They finished recruitment in like 2010. So most people are now, you're getting at like a good age range. Yeah, um, you mentioned that you have a really great talk. I have two questions. One question is that UK Biobank also provided the um, whole extra statistics and also the whole um, uh, genomes, um, and, um, 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 whole genomes uh, didn't have to provide. So um, right now, the, the uh, models you're using is just using the imaging data. So I was thinking that uh, how you concerned to uh, integrate um, genomic, um, genomics data and with the imaging data together to uh, have the much higher uh, accuracy of the predictions. Yes. Um, so, so I guess sort of along the lines of uh, Chad and, and Benoit's questions, like the, it, we are looking at rare variants with the exome sequencing right now. It's tricky. Like, you know, the error properties of exome sequencing are a little bit unfavorable compared to those of whole genome sequencing. But the thing that recommends it is the greater depth. You really see this with CHIP. Not that I talked about CHIP at all in this talk, but like, so, I mean, they just released the whole genomes uh, like a month ago. But I have called CHIP, for example, on the whole genome data and on the whole exome data. The depth is so shallow on the whole genomes. It's fine for germline variant calling. So like, we could, we could redo all of this. Uh, um, in the whole genome data, but it's not good for every uh, type of analysis that people want to do. Um, for common variants, I don't think it matters at all, sadly. I mean, it'll help you clean up your, your, um, your like correlation structure because you no longer have um, uh, assumptions to make. So I think, in fact, especially for multi-ancestry analyses, for joint multi-ancestry analyses, which frankly is what I do for all my GWASs, I don't exclude people by ancestry. I use methods that are appropriate for, you know, analyzing multi, you know, people of different ancestries. Um, it will clean up those analyses. Because right now we're using a European-based inference panel, so we're misspecifying a lot of people's variation. The, the only issue is it's usually not a huge misspecification for common variants because they're common. And so the, there's not a ton of common variants that have diverged across human populations, but the answer, it, the number is not zero. Um, and certainly a little frequencies have diverged, but very few have actually like uh, become fixed at one or zero. Um. So, so uh, <clears throat> that's a great talk. Uh, can you give us more information on your index for your cardiac aging? I mean, I would assume that you draw a scale and you're on the extreme, you have E to A prime, you have your LVEF, you have LVE d d dimensions, uh, you have your hypertrophy. And 
you know, and then patients who have these numbers are somewhere much older. But are you able to say that, oh, based on this uh, MRI, this is somebody from age 30 to 40, or age 40 to 50, or age 50 to 60. Are, are you claiming that? Or, uh, because the reason why I'm asking is that on a population level, you can look for that trend. Mm -hmm. But on an individual person level, it becomes very, very difficult, meaning that you could take uh, Steph Curry's uh, MRI, and he would likely have hypertrophy, and then you would wrongly predict that he's age 60. Yeah, I mean, these are great points, and this is like a layered question, all of which are good. Starting with the first and last point, in some sense, they're, they're similar, which is um, the individual measurements. Like, if you were to predict age with these individual measurements, like, you know, ED prime or aortic diameter was sort of like my shtick, um, you would get the wrong answer, just like you're saying. You would, you would think that super fit people are super unhealthy. Um, so I think the advantage of the deep learning models is that they're not stuck with just those measurements. Like, the disadvantage is trying to interpret them becomes a whole different ball game. Um, I don't have a good interpretation right now, except by inference, you know, except by, you know, running a parallel analysis with, with structures that I do understand and then making that comparison. Um, so interpretability is super challenging with, with deep learning models, and even when people do it, I generally don't believe it. Um, so, uh, and I think that there's good reason. Uh, a lot of the evidence suggests that interpretability in the way that people try to do it doesn't actually have any meaning on average. Um, the, I definitely agree that if you were trying to predict a person's age, this stuff isn't very meaningful. I mean, you could do it. You could build a company around it. You could sell it. You could make money. But like, does it have meaning at an individual level? Like, not really. Like, that distribution is too wide. The prediction interval is going to be too high. Um, and I don't really think of it like, like my goal isn't to predict your age. You know what your age is. So like, who cares? But I do think that there's potentially interest at a biological level of understanding, you know, what is it that makes your heart look younger or older? Do we understand, do we already measure all that stuff clinically, or is there something left on the table that we haven't figured out? And if so, can we come up with a, a more standard biomarker that we will use in the future to understand that missing piece? And I think that's the thing we haven't answered yet, but that would be kind of the goal for me of this line of inquiry.